A 31-year-old NYPD officer, husband and father of a young child was gunned down and executed by, you guessed it, career thugs who should have never been on the streets to begin with. The war on cops rages on, and meanwhile, the leaders of that godforsaken city and state are preoccupied with getting Trump. Today also marks the one-year anniversary of the Nashville Covenant School shooting when a trans person opened fire on innocent children. America is lawless, and your leaders are interested in coddling the ones doing it and cannot be bothered to protect the decent folks being victimized on a daily basis. The show starts now. The information I'm about to share is preliminary and is subject to change as the investigation continues. At about 5.48 p.m., two officers, both assigned to the NYPD's critical response team, were conducting a vehicle stop at 1919 Mott Avenue. After approaching the car, the suspect inside the vehicle displayed a firearm and pointed it toward the officers. Shots were fired and one of our officers was struck. Tragically, they couldn't save him and he succumbed to his injuries. NYPD officer Jonathan Diller, say his name. He was gunned down and executed on Monday evening by two thugs. The suspects, both the shooter and the driver, have lengthy criminal records. Between the two of them, at least 20 prior arrests, including a gun charge for the driver less than a year ago. This can be directly tied to New York's lax and ludicrous felon coddling policies. Those policies give thugs the benefit of the doubt at the expense of decent folks. And as for the leaders y'all liberals keep electing, well, they're a little preoccupied with spotlight and narcissism, so don't expect much more than a tweet about it. Take New York Attorney General Tish James, who tweeted this out yesterday. Good to know she is thinking of the family. But you know the pinned tweet that is directly above that half-hearted tweet about Officer Diller? Well, it's this one, her pinned tweet about getting Donald Trump. Thugs, felons, degenerates, tweakers, and illegal immigrants have taken over New York, but she is dead set and focused on getting Trump. It really puts it in perspective, doesn't it? To the young family of Officer Jonathan Diller, please know that we're thinking of you. We are heartbroken for you. We are praying for you. And to all the families of our brave law enforcement officers around the country, please know that we see you and we see your sacrifice. And I ask that we all take at least a moment to send a prayer up for them and their families. There's been quite a war on cops raging for many years now, and it may be a passing headline to some, but for those families, it's a lifetime of sacrifice and sorrow. Law enforcement officers are the unappreciated who must do the unimaginable and see the unthinkable to protect the ungrateful. So God bless you all. Joining me now with his take on this and more is host of The Operator with Rob O'Neill. Rob O'Neill. Rob, it's great to have you. I have so many things to ask you about, but I want to go to this NYPD officer first. You know, we're probably going to have a little bit of discussion about this for a couple of days. It'll fade out of the headlines and the war on cops will continue. Does this ever end? Is there ever a time when our officers are, are not being targeted and their their sacrifice is not being dismissed by our leaders? Well, thank you for having me, Tommy. It's great to be with you. Yeah, this is a this is going to be an issue. And it's I mean, it's dangerous to be a police officer, even in safe cities. But now that you've got district attorney, uh, uh, district attorneys doing stuff like this and 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 uh, different elected officials who defund the police and talk bad about police and all they want to do is the cops are bad and you're a victim. And, uh, you know, the, I mean, cash was bailed. They're letting people out. This dude that shot Officer Diller, he had been arrested, I think, 20 plus times, a few felonies, um, weapons charges, assault. He's not a good guy. He, should, he shouldn't be on the streets and he's a dangerous person. I mean, it's the point now where there's so many phones too. When it Cops don't even want to get involved a lot of time because someone will record them doing something and then they get, you know, they they risk going to jail. Uh, it's it's an upside down world. The grass is blue. Down is up. Up is down. And um, I mean, the, the New York was safe when they had Giuliani and then that was about it. It's it's slowly. I was just there the other day and it's it's going downhill. Yeah, it's been going downhill for, for many years now, obviously. COVID made it a lot worse. And then you've got businesses that were already struggling and now trying to get back on their feet and deal with regulations. They're coming after the pizza ovens. 
they're, they're coming after everything. And then you've got, you know, obviously the lawfare against Donald Trump that also gives businesses a second thought about being in New York to begin with. But, you know, you've got the National Guard now that's having to be called into the subway system. Just had someone the other day, once again, pushing somebody into a train, um, didn't care, la kind of laughed it off afterwards, didn't show really any remorse. But, you know, the left and the leftist media will tell you, actually, folks, crime is going down. Look at the statistics. The things that you're feeling and seeing in your cities are actually wrong. Um, I'm not so sure leading with, hey, things are down and things are going great is the best strategy. But do you think places that keep electing Democrats are starting to get the hint? I don't think so. I think that they're good at complaining about it, but they always reelect the incumbents. It's the same. It's the same pretty much all over the country, too. But the big cities. Uh, they complain about the migrants. They complain about the resources. The schools are bad. They keep reelecting Democrats, and it's it's sort of like you know it's like with the squatting stuff too. Your elections have consequences, and why you keep electing these people? People are leaving New York. I mean, you're seeing what they do with the uh, just all on emotion. They get a lot of votes just by getting people riled up. Letitia James was uh, put in place because she wanted to go after Donald Trump. That's it. And that's all they, they care about. And they want to destroy their political enemies like the fascists that they are. And uh, and, and and people see this. And, and what's sad is, uh, you know, almost half the country cheers for this stuff. You see the court gestures on the late night television talking about, well, we can't wait for them to take Trump's plane and he can stand in line at Southwest. This is fascism. That's what they do. And then it's admit nothing, deny everything, make counter accusations. That's what they're doing. And it's uh, the, the cities are getting worse. That You can't, you know, the, in Pittsburgh, there are, are hours hours in the middle of the night where no, there are no cops at all. There's a call box. And I'm not even sure how that works. Like press one for assault or press two if you're dead mm -hmm. or something. I don't, I don't I don't even know how that works, but it's it's crazy. And uh, it's there. It's real. And you, people like to talk about it on social media. And then they, at the ballot box, they go right down the D line. And it's going to it's going to stay bad as long as they keep doing it. You know, and I wonder, too, we often see these videos of, of mayhem in New York City, L.A., any other city where you see somebody doing something horrible, beating somebody else, beating an innocent person, assaulting somebody, and you see people recording it but not really doing anything, and we say, why would nobody step in? Why would nobody do something? Well, then, perfect example, also in New York, you've got Daniel Penny, the former Marine, who yep. did step in, and he said, listen, I'm not going to let this person hurt innocent people. And as somebody who's obviously a military man yourself, uh, if you were in that position and you saw a homeless tweaker or whatever threatening people on a subway train, given what happened to Daniel Penny, would you still stand up and do something in that environment? The the sad thing is there would definitely be a hesitation on my part, and a hesitation is enough to get you hurt or killed simply because of I, I don't know if it's worth going to jail because I'm probably not going to get a, a a fair trial in New York because I lean conservative and like to tell the truth sometimes. Uh, yeah, I mean it's it's it, is it worth it or can I just leave and and have it not affect my family? It's it's a sad state of affairs when you, you not only there are not enough cops, we don't let the uh, um, the National Guard have their rifles. They're in there acting like TSA checking bags. When, and just the other day on the New York uh, subways, the, the criminals figured, well, I'll just carry the gun in my pocket. They won't find it in my bag. Pretty smart. Uh, that worked that way. And and uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, it all depends on what was happening. If, if it's if it's dire straits or someone's going to get pushed, I'm, I'm going to interject. But if it's, you know, it's just going to be someone getting beat up and me not going to jail, maybe not. It's hard to say, but it's sad that we have to think that way. It's really sad. And I often think about that when I'm walking around the streets of New York and I see a lot of elderly folks walking around and I think to myself, if somebody wanted to steal from them, mess with them, hurt them out of even just pleasure, which happens unfortunately pretty often, um, mm -hmm. I obviously couldn't do anything, but I don't know that any of the men walking around near me, I don't know if they would step in, I don't know if they would do anything to protect the vulnerable. And maybe it's because they're afraid, maybe it's because they weren't raised that way to be decent and to have that instinct to protect the innocent. But either way, society's going to hell. Um, I want to also talk to you about, you know, we thought we got rid of ISIS, ISIS-K, whatever they want to call themselves, with Donald Trump, who decimated ISIS. And now we're figuring out that they're probably coming across our border, probably in pretty mm -hmm. significant numbers. How concerned are you that we're inviting terrorists through our southern border, undetected, unapprehended, and that there are already ter terror cells here waiting to strike? 
I'm extremely concerned, and it's it's going to happen. It's not a matter of, well, if we keep doing this, something bad might happen. It's here. And uh, ISIS-K, uh, which is the case for Khorasan, which is an area of that part of the world near Afghanistan and um, near Iran, places like that. But these dudes in Russia, were uh, they're from Tajikistan, and the Tajiks are in Afghanistan now. And what ISIS is doing there, I mean, they're smart. These are all postures. These are Afghans or hardcore Taliban. But what they're telling these foreigners that are in war-torn countries, if you come here, you will truly be a Muslim if you join ISIS. And then they send them out on attacks. What, what, you know, what happened in Russia? Still people wondering, you know, that wasn't really an ISIS type attack because they want to be martyrs. They normally die. These guys didn't, which they probably wish they did once they got captured by the Russians. But it's not just ISIS. And by the way, they have our weapons, too, that we left in Afghanistan. So that's good. Uh, and our and our uh, night vision and our, you know, stuff like that. But it's not just ISIS. It'll be ISIS. It'll be Al Qaeda. It'll be Islamic Jihad. It'll be Hezbollah and Hamas. And, uh, you know, it's it's uh, Chinese battalions coming here as sleeper cells when that happens. And they're here, too. Iranians are here. This is uh, the borders wide open. And it's it's a political game for the people in the echo chamber that we call the capital. But it's going to be I mean, it's real now. If you know, imagine going to, if in a major blue city, you go to the hospital and the emergency room, you got to wait 10 hours because there's so many migrants in front of you. That's happening. The schools are getting worse because not, I mean, it's not even Spanish. It's so many different languages. And the school boards are saying just deal with it. But when the attack comes, and it will. It's going to be on a gun-free zone, and pretty soon we'll all be saying, well, why didn't we see that coming? Well, it's coming, and I'm telling you right now. Yeah, I can't imagine that it wouldn't be coming, and I can't imagine with the focus now on DEI and inclusion and pronouns and gender changes and all this, I can't imagine that we would be in any place to be ready for it. Then you've got, you know, of course, our Secretary of Defense, who just took a little hiatus and didn't really bother to tell anybody. So everything seems like it's in shambles. And I don't know, and I want to get your take on this, too. It feels like there are people that would be just fine and dandy going to a war again, that they would like to see the United States in a full-fledged war. So I'm not even sure that there are people in leadership positions that are necessarily that concerned about something sparking a World War III. In fact, I think they're kind of just sitting back waiting for it because it would do well for their pocketbook and their bottom line. And I'm wondering how close you think we are to that reality. Well, that's precisely it, too. And if you could think about it, I know in my lifetime, there's always been a war or a threat of war. And there's a lot of stuff that gets made and people make big contracts and a lot of money. And granted, I love the uh, the engineer that designs a hellfire that we had to call in in Iraq or Afghanistan or wherever. Uh, but there's a lot of money out there. And just because wars end doesn't mean the contracts do. So they, they, they love the war. They're not personally involved. And, and you can tell what kind of people you have in there. Uh, Secretary Austin, who was under anesthesia, so he's out of it. And he he goes under oath. He was a four-star general. He knows how the, uh, the system works. He knows knows that uh, there, there's systems in place for when you go, someone below you knows how to do your job and, and so on and so on. And he said, well, now that this happened, we're going to put systems in place, which is nonsense because they are in place. He knows they're in place, but that's how they talk to us because they figure we might listen to them for a few seconds and then, oh, real quick, reality TV's on or it's March Madness or I got to, you know, I got to pay attention to the distractions as opposed to what's actually happening. Yeah, there's going to be, it seems like there's always going to be wars and, and you're dealing with uh with a place, the Pentagon, they've never passed a budget and they cost them a billion dollars to do it. Who in the world, like a billion dollars is a lot of money to do an audit. I know a couple of guys in Georgia could knock it out for maybe a cool million and that you'd have your, you have your budget and how much money you're wasting, but it's, it's la la land. The money is printed. It's fake. No one, ca all they care about, like you said, their bottom line, uh, how much money they can make. And, and that's basically what Washington is. It's unfortunate because I don't see it changing anytime soon. Uh, I hope Trump gets reelected, but even if Trump gets reelected, I don't see them ever seizing to go after the man. I don't think they're ever going to say, all right, he's the president again. Now we're just going to let him do his job. I think it's going to be witch hunt after witch hunt after witch hunt after witch hunt, which even if he does get reelected and he's the president of the United States, they can still hamstring him to such an extent that he can't really get a whole lot done. So it really feels really uh, helpless right now. Um, I do want to turn to a little bit of pop culture intersecting with law enforcement, and I want to turn to the, some of the Diddy news. Now, it's not mm -hmm. often that I would think I would be talking about Puff Daddy and how this is all going down, but boy, when you've got raids in L.A., you've got raids in Miami, you've got them tracking your private jet, and you're being named in this sex trafficking, sexual assault, rape, all of that, I mean, it's not looking good. But I'm wondering, there's been a lot of speculation if Diddy's actually supposedly the alleged mastermind behind this or if he's the fall guy for it. When you're looking at this, how do you think this is going to shake out? 
Well, this is uh, interesting because you have the the feds there. They got their tactical gear on. The camera crews from the news media were tipped off, so they are there. So it went down for a reason. And uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I've never met uh, Diddy. I don't know anything about him. I've heard things here and there. I I listened to the Cat Williams interview when he said 2024, and he was saying stuff that you know when I was driving, I'm like, this guy's a little off the rocker, but he, some of it's coming true. And again, with the Hollywood stuff and and you know the illegal stuff, the Florida stuff with. A lot more with the trafficking is uh, is coming to. We're seeing a lot more of it now with different movies being made, uh, people speaking up and and seeing the horrors of it. Because that's something that's so bad. You, at least me personally, I I want to not believe it's true. It shouldn't be true. But you start hearing rumblings like this. All of a sudden, my man gets on a plane. He goes to Antigua, selling off uh, parts of companies he owns. Guy's worth a billion dollars. I mean, he doesn't need to come back, and that's very telling. But uh, I mean, either the feds are cracking down on something or, there, or there's, you know, we talked about the deep state. It's not the elected officials. It's the three letter agencies, the unelected people that don't make laws, but they give you mandates that you have to follow, which is nonsense. But uh, you start getting them involved with something. There's there's usually a bigger picture behind it. Um, I, you know, I don't I don't really have a dog in this fight, but it is uh, it's something to see. It's a, a lot of stuff happening in the country and the world that I didn't expect to happen. Well, if this all does turn out to be true, I'm just glad that some of our law enforcement agencies are going after trafficking and pedophiles and sexual abusers instead of just going after and spending all of their time and energy going after Donald Trump and his affiliates because, you know, that would actually be a worthwhile endeavor. So I hope that there's, you know, an end to yeah. this that maybe brings somebody to justice and might crack some of this open, although I'm not going to hold my breath. It just feels like we've been lied to so much at this point. I don't right. know how we get to the truth. Last thing I want to talk to you about, of course, um, we, we know that the, the tragic incident with the bridge in Baltimore, um, I want to replay something from back in November of 2021 that I think gives us the reason that that bridge did in fact collapse. And it's, of course, because um, the bridge was racist. Let's take a listen. If an underpass was constructed such that a bus carrying mostly black and Puerto Rican kids uh, to a beach, or there would have been, uh, in New York was, was designed uh, too low for it to pass by, that that obviously reflects racism that went into those design choices. Um, I don't think we have anything to lose by confronting that simple reality. And I think we have everything to gain by acknowledging it and then dealing with it, which is why the reconnecting communities, that billion dollars, is something we want to get to work right away. So what are the chances that racism and or climate change ends up being to blame for all of this? It's it's absolutely amazing that they can throw racism at anything. I remember a couple like a year ago, math was racist because of certain tests and things like that. And they let them throw the racism around. And that on itself is sad just because it takes away from actual racism that happens. This is all nonsense from a from a white dude that I think has the. Well, the second easiest job in the government, right behind the vice president. But yeah, just to to uh, to be talking racist, like I mean, what they should be considering is why this happened. Was it incompetence, and why um, was it bad fuel that made uh, uh, everything, all the electronics break down? Is it a terrorist attack? They don't want to talk about that. I mean, the FBI immediately said. It uh, was not a terrorist attack, but they've been wrong before. You know, the Pulse nightclub, Orlando, Fort Hood, Fort Lauderdale, stuff like that comes to mind where it can't be terrorism. And when they say it can't be, it can be. That's a major uh, – um, that bridge was designed, I think, to – Trans, uh, transport hazardous material throughout the country. It's off now the port, not the biggest in the country, but a major port. Um, this, I mean, if anything, it could be a driver and it could be an accident, but then you got to say, well, <laughs> is this like the, the airlines with the doors flying off and wheels mm -hmm. not working and duct tape and the damn whatever? I mean, is this, is this the new norm? We've just, we've dumbed ourselves down so much that we can expect bridges to fall. And then, you know, planes will start falling out of the sky pretty soon, I guess. Well, what bothers me, too, is whether this was an accident or a failure of systems or whatever, um, people are watching this and learning how easy it is to take down mm -hmm. such an important bridge. So that's m more my concern is they're saying, oh, wow, you know, American infrastructure is built that poorly that just a rogue ship could take down a, a very important bridge. So that's my biggest concern, again, all linking back to the terrorism and the vulnerabilities that we have ingrained into our system, thanks to our president, who cares more about ice cream and pronouns. So here we are. Not a lot of optimism, but I always appreciate you coming on the show and giving it to us straight. And uh, I would hope that if anything were ever to go down, I would be next to somebody like you because I know that you would step in and I know that you would act. And unfortunately, there are not a lot of men like you left. So well, please uh, teach it, spread it far and wide. And I guess the lesson in all this is stay in a red state where you can still do the right thing okay. and not go to jail for it. I really appreciate the kind words and it's great to be with you, Tommy. Anytime. Appreciate it. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much. Bye.
All right, folks, today marks the one year anniversary of the Nashville Covenant School shooting. One year ago today, a transgender mowed down six innocent Christians, and we've yet to be given the motive. It's time for final thoughts. One year ago today, a 28-year-old self-proclaimed transgender carried out her plan to murder innocent Christians at the Covenant School here in Nashville, Tennessee. Brave Nashville officers took her down and ended her hate-filled rampage, but not before she could steal the lives of six innocent Christians, including three children under the age of 10. One year later, and we st are still left with more questions than answers, specifically about the motive of the shooter. Despite the fact that the trans shooter targeted and killed students at a Christian school, many in the media, including our First Lady, Vice President, and Press Secretary, took it upon themselves to instead protect and shield the transgender community. As is usually the case, when Christians are murdered, it's about the weapon, not the shooter, and not the victims. But speaking of the shooter, despite the fact that we know she kept several journals and writings about her plan, her motive, and her sick delusions, the authorities have yet to release those to the public. A series of lawsuits back and forth have stalled the release of the manifesto, though a few pages of it were leaked months ago. The leaked pages reveal the trans shooter sought to hunt down white people of privilege. That motive and mindset is becoming all too common these days, and it's not hard to figure out why. But it's not just the leftists and the Rainbow Mafia that have worked to keep the entirety of the trans shooter's manifesto buried. Parents of the Covenant School kids have also been working to keep it hidden. But why? I sat down with two of these moms for an extensive and uncensored conversation about it all. From what really happened that fateful day to the manifesto and even the gun control legislation that's been pushed in the aftermath, take a look. It's been a year since the deadly and tragic Covenant Christian School massacre right here in Nashville. I'm sure it feels like yesterday for both of you and for your families. I answered the phone call and on the phone was my son and he was crying out to me to come save him. They just sat there and they waited to be next. As she exited, she said she saw a little shoe in the hallway and they thought their friends had fainted. Is it possible to re-enter that building and not be re-traumatized? I have my child back, but there are holes that are missing from her. And the school kind of went to lengths to keep this, this manifesto, these journalings, whatever you want to call it, hidden in private. Please explain, you know, why I wanted to know I want to read every single page. The full, unedited, and uncensored Covenant special will air right here on Tommy Laren is Fearless on OutKick on Monday, April 1st at 7 p.m. Eastern. Do not miss this. God bless the families of the Covenant School on this painful anniversary, and God bless our Nashville law enforcement officers who answered the call and saved countless young lives that day. Those are my final thoughts from Nashville. God bless and take care.